The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. You know, now the word of the Lord, as it is found in Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Now, when the Magi had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And so Joseph arose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. And he remained there until the death of Herod. And all this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. This It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we make our way through the birth narrative in the Gospel of Matthew, we've come to what really is the darkest and most troubling section of the story. Familiar to us, but oftentimes uh, glanced over. Uh, But in this dark section of the story, we see precisely why Jesus had to come. So let's pray that once again we would see the clarity of the gospel, uh, the wonder of the gospel, uh, the transforming character of the gospel, uh, why Christmas had to happen in the first place. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and uh, for uh, the good news that it brings for a bad news world. Uh, We pray that you would now open our eyes, that we might behold wonderful things in it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. If there is one thing that Matthew highlights uh, throughout his entire birth narrative, it is the extraordinary paradox that lies at the heart of the whole story. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, the exciting quality of Christmas rests on an ancient and admitted paradox. It rests upon the great paradox that the power and the center of the whole universe may be found in some seemingly small matter that the stars and their courses may move about like a, a moving wheel round the neglected outhouse of an inn. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way, infinite and yet an infant, eternal and yet born of a woman, almighty yet hanging on a woman's breast, supporting a universe yet needing to be carried in a mother's arms. He was the king of angels and yet the reputed son of Joseph. He was the heir of all things yet The carpenter's despised son. Augustine put it this way. He was the maker of the sun. He is made under the sun. In the father he remains, but from his mother he goes forth. Creator of heaven and earth, he was born on earth under heaven. Unspeakably wise, he is wisely speechless. But filling the world, he lies in a manger, a ruler of the stars. He nurses at his mother's breast. He is both great in the nature of God and small in the form of a servant. It's a great paradox. Beyond anything we can think or imagine, John puts it this way in John chapter 1, the true light Uh, which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, yet the world did not know him. He came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. Uh, Paradox at every turn. Uh, My favorite Christmas poem is by G.K. Chesterton, and it It focuses on this great paradox. There is fallen on the earth for a token, a God too great for the sky. 
He has burst out of all things and broken the bonds of eternity there lie. Who is proud when the heavens are so humble? Who mounts if the mountains fall? If the fixed stars topple and tumble and the deluge of love drowns all. Glory to God in the highest, shout the angels. But we declare glory to God in the lowest. Here in Matthew chapter 2, we see how low Jesus descends in his incarnation. It's the uh, third scene in uh, the birth narrative. And for the third time, we have a a, a dream uh, mediated by angels delivering a message from the Father. And for the third time, uh, we see Matthew declaring that all these things fulfill what the prophets had said before. And that we have, in a sense, the third great paradox. The first paradox was uh, that though the birth of Christ was heralded by angels and attended by shepherds, uh, declared to be the fulfillment of prophecies in the temple by Anna and Simeon, uh, yet those uh, who had been charged to look for, uh, yearn for, uh, the signs of his coming in Jerusalem ignored it altogether. A second great paradox was uh, that wise men from the east came uh, to worship before the newborn king. But upon word that there was a newborn king, Herod, who built the temple, and the priests and the scribes who served in it, and all Jerusalem around it, uh, we're told were troubled by the news. Now here, uh, we have the third great paradox. The maker of the world, the savior of the world, the one who upholds the whole existence of the world uh, by the word of his power, finds no place in the world. He's harried into exile as a refugee. In verse 13, we're told that an angel appeared in a dream to Joseph and gave a series of commands. But first, the angel says, rise. The Greek word is filled with portent and urgency. It's a word that literally means, get up and get up now. Hasten yourself. And then the command, take the child and his mother. The, uh, the word for take here is, is a word that literally means uh, to, to surround with protection. Uh, the, the idea is, uh, is filled with the sense of responsibility. So not only is there urgency, there is also this, this sense of responsibility. Now, take the mother and the child and flee. Uh, the Greek word that's used here for flee uh, l- literally means to hasten away, uh, c- quickly run. It's, it's filled with a sense of danger. And, and then finally, uh, the angel says, that here's where you're to flee. You're to flee to, of all places, Egypt. Immediately, our minds, and surely Joseph's mind, uh, would have gone to the stories of other exiles in Egypt. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. These are not happy memories. Egypt is uh, dangerous. It is a dark place. All through the Old Testament, Egypt is, in a sense, the emblem of wickedness. In fact, in Psalm 87, Egypt is called Rahab. It's a a Hebrew word that literally means hungry, gaping crocodile. So the angel says, okay, this is urgent. Get up, quick. 
I want you to run to the hungry crocodile. It seems to make absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then if you know your Bible at all, you know that, that, that Egypt was the object of the scorn and the prophetic uh, just enmity of virtually all of the prophets. Uh, beginning in Genesis chapter 15 and uh, then the whole book of Exodus Then Isaiah chapters 19 and 20 and Isaiah chapter 45, Jeremiah chapter 9, Jeremiah chapter 43, Jeremiah chapters 44 and 46, Ezekiel chapters 29 to 32, Hosea chapter 8, Joel chapter 3, Zechariah chapter 10. I mean, we can go on and on and on. The whole Old Testament is filled with declarations that this is the dark, dark corner of a fallen, wicked, perverse, dangerous world. Jesus is born in a stable in Bethlehem. The angels sing, the shepherds attend, the wise men come bearing gifts, and the next thing we know, he's fleeing for his life to Egypt. Of all places. And and the reason is given at the end of the verse. uh, We're told it's because Herod is about to search for the child. In order to destroy him. We think of Christmas as this humble, bucolic kind of scene. What this passage is reminding us of So we live in a fragile, dangerous, death-laden, dark world. That's the world that Jesus came to save. In verse 14, uh, we're told Joseph's response. He rose, he took the child and mother by night, and he departed to Egypt. Now, I don't know about you, but my obedience to the Lord is usually pretty halting and questioning. Are you sure, Lord? Do you mind, Lord, if I create a a pro and con list on this one? Uh, Can can I examine all of the details? Uh, Let's look at all worst case scenarios and Egypt. Egypt, Lord, are you sure about the Egypt part? Joseph has none of this. Look at this response. He immediately arises. He immediately takes the child and the mother by night. He doesn't even wait until morning. I'd be thinking to myself, you know, at least let me have breakfast and a cup of coffee before I go. No. He immediately responds. And then according to verse 15, it says, and he remained there. Until the death of Herod. Now we know the timeline historically of uh, Herod's life. And so we know that it's highly likely that this was a short interval of time. Uh, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were not in Egypt for this long sustained season. Nevertheless, Joseph is unhesitating. And he does exactly what he is commanded. And then finally, we're told in verse 15, all of this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. And then there is this quotation from part of Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now, as we've seen, Matthew was very careful to show that all of the events of Christ's incarnation, his life, his ministry, his sacrificial death, his resurrection, even his ascension, were all fulfillments of the Old Testament's redemptive promises. Jesus was born of a virgin, fulfilling Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. He was born in Bethlehem 
fulfilling uh, Micah chapter 5, uh, verse 2. He was targeted for execution by Herod, fulfilling Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 15. He was preceded uh, by uh, John the Baptist, fulfilling Isaiah 40, verse 3. Uh, eventually, He would gather disciples around him, and he would teach in parables and dark sayings of old, fulfilling Psalm 78, verse 2. He cared for the poor. He healed the sick. He he walked among the lowly, the despised, and the rejected, fulfilling Isaiah 53, verse 4. He triumphantly Uh, would enter into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. We we could go on and on. Uh, Matthew Poole says uh, that there are some 356 prophecies fulfilled by the life and ministry of Christ. Alfred Edersheim uh, puts the number at 405 specific prophecies from the Old Testament fulfilled in the new. Now, when we look at the New Testament use of Old Testament prophecy, it's important for us to remember several things. First, it's important for us to remember that the whole Bible is about just one thing. That every event, every prophecy, and every story points to this one central message. So when we read the Bible, we should always be looking for the pattern of creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. And, and eventually we should see that, that, that every uh, fall and redemption and restoration uh, points to the ultimate and consummate restoration that we have in Jesus Christ. The second thing that we have to remember is that the New Testament lies hidden in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. A third thing that we have to remember is that that Scripture has only one meaning, but but has many applications. Fourth, we have to remember that all prophecy has both an immediate context and fulfillment and an ongoing context and fulfillment. And finally, a consummate context and fulfillment. And so every Bible prophecy reflects both the already and the not yet. And then finally, we have to remember that all of history is unified by God's sovereign plan so that the earlier parts are designed to correspond and to point to the later parts. Now, I've just given you this little primer on hermeneutics because Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, is very problematical. Let let me tell you, commentators have been doing backflips and and mental gymnastics for centuries trying to make sense of this particular prophecy. Uh, Matthew was very deliberate and precise in his reliance on Old Testament prophecy, but his use here of this particular prophecy from Hosea seems very problematical. Out of Egypt I called my son. If you look at it in context, Hosea chapter 11 is is talking about the exodus. It is a backward look at a previous event. uh, When the Lord uh, delivered his fledgling people out of bondage in Egypt. But here in Matthew... Matthew indicates that the prophecy is simultaneously a forward look to the incarnation when uh, the Lord would deliver his people from the bondage of sin. So the question is, how is it possible that one prophetic declaration could be both a remembrance of things past and an anticipation of things yet to come. 
Now, oftentimes commentators resort to one of two answers to that question. Either uh, they uh, get very, very uh, narrow and they say, well, obviously Hosea didn't really know what the Holy Spirit was putting into his mouth and he thought he was talking about the Exodus, but he really wasn't talking about the Exodus. He was talking about the Incarnation. Or there are the interpretive maximalists who, uh, who essentially allegorize the whole Bible so that everything is about Jesus and everything from the Song of Solomon to every single psalm is talking about Jesus very specifically. And the thing is, is that neither of those is particularly good uh, 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 or even fruitful ways to read the Bible. So let's get into the weeds a little bit in this text. The Greek word that Matthew uses here for fulfill is plerothi. It literally means to fill up. Matthew was affirming that Jesus fills up the Old Testament. He is the satisfaction of every Old Testament uh, promise. He's the crux of every Old Testament image. He's what every Old Testament story portends. This is an allegory, uh, but it is a demonstration that all creation was groaning and yearning for this particular moment. And all of providential history is arranged so that we could see our need for Christ. The, the, here is um, the, the difference between a really specific uh, fulfillment and this broader biblical theology kind of fulfillment. So a really specific fulfillment of a prophecy is Isaiah tells us that a a virgin will uh, give birth to a son. And uh, we're told in Micah that this son will be born in Bethlehem. This is a very, very specific kind of prophecy. But what we have here is simply a declaration that the whole Bible is pointing to this consummate moment. You remember that uh, Matthew opens his account of the gospel uh, with uh, Christ's genealogy. The very first words in Greek are biblos, genesos, yesku, Christos. Literally meaning this is the book of the genesis of Jesus the Christ. In, In other words, Jesus is... The new Genesis. Now, by using Hosea's prophecy here, uh, just one chapter later, Matthew is declaring that not only is Jesus now the new Genesis, he has come to lead the new Exodus. Christmas is the beginning of the great fulfillment of God's redemptive purpose. R.C. Sproul puts it this way. He says, uh, Matthew means to remind us that the whole history of redemption in the Old Testament is simply pointing us to Christ. You, um, you remember that old joke about um, the Sunday school? Uh, Sunday school teacher says, what's, uh, what's brown, eats nuts, kind of furry, and has a big bushy tail? And a little boy says, I want to say squirrel, but I'll go ahead and just say Jesus. (laughs) And the truth is, is that little boy had at least an inkling of good biblical theology. Because everything does point us to the consummation of every promise in Christ Jesus. Think about the the, the plot line of this story. Now, after his birth in Bethlehem, Jesus is rushed away to safety in order to avoid the wrath of a jealous king who has ordered that all of the baby boys should be killed. You recognize that story? Of course. From the book of Exodus. 
Pharaoh fears the Jews and he orders the extermination of all of the baby boys. Moses was only spared because he was hidden in a basket on the Nile. Now Jesus would be spared, hidden away in Egypt, so that he too could lead his people away from the bondage of sin and slavery into full freedom. Matthew intends for us to see this this remarkable Hosea prophecy as a reminder that Jesus is the fulfillment of every promise. He's the consummation of, of all that Israel yearned for. If you read the Old Testament, you see over and over and over again after the book of Exodus, celebrations of the Exodus. God has set his people free. Uh, The the bonds of slavery have been shattered. Uh, Pharaoh's iron fist is no longer on the head of our people. And and yet, we're still in bondage to sin. We're still in slavery to sin. When will we be set free from that bondage? Uh, Matthew is saying, now, it's here. Christmas has come. The promise is before us to be fulfilled. A true redemption of God's people was merely foreshadowed during the first exodus. Jesus came to bring completion to God's perfect plan. Thus, Matthew was right to say, this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is the new and better, uh, the new and living covenant. It is now at hand. Uh, The Old Testament prophecy is now filled up. The promise has been fulfilled. Now, all of this uh, reminds us of how we need to read the Bible and why. It, It reminds us Uh, that in the midst of a world filled with darkness, there is light. In the midst of a world filled with evil and malfeasance, uh, uh, there is hope and goodness. In the uh, midst of our slavery to sin and to death, uh, there is a Redeemer who rescues us from the slave market of sin and sets us free. It's a reminder uh, to us uh, that in a world that is filled up with high crimes and misdemeanors in which every single one of us deserves to be impeached, that there is yet hope. And when we read our Bibles, we see it on every page. Uh, Secondly, This whole story reminds us of how to celebrate Christmas and why. It's it's not all bright lights, glitter, and uh, fluffy bows. Uh, Christmas really is about the glory of God descending to the lowest, into the depths. It wasn't enough for Jesus uh, to be born humbly, in a stable, in a tiny town, attended only by shepherds and angels. It wasn't enough for the first to acknowledge that his regency were wise men from the east. Oh no, he had to go further, deeper into the darkness, all the way to Egypt, all the way into exile as a refugee with no place for him, not only not in the inn, not anywhere in all of Israel. He came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. That's the message of Christmas. And third, This whole story reminds us of the extraordinary paradox that lies at the heart of the Christmas story. The pitch of the stall was glorious. Though the straw was dusty and old, the wind 
sang with orchestral beauty, though it blew bitter and cold. The night was mysteriously gleaming, though the earth was fallen forlorn. For under the eaves of splendor, a a child, the child, was born. Oxen, sheep, and and doves uh, crowded round the nativity scene. Though the world still failed to grasp, t'was here that peace had been. Cast out into a cave when no room was found for him, his coming was a scourge that cleansed the robber's den. While the temples become a cattle stall where beasts and such are sold, the child's turned manger into temple and changed the base to gold. Tis the paradox of the ages. Worldly wisdom will ne'er relent to notice the signs of visitation nor the cords of the whip of Advent. Extraordinary paradox. He came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, to all who would receive him, he gave the right to become children of God. That is the glory of the Christmas message. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.